Neuroscience is the science of, of neurons, which is the active component or the uh, component responsible for thinking in our brains and acting and perceiving. And for um, more, than, more than a century, people have been studying neurons and working out the biology of neurons and, and how they work and grow and interact with each other, often looking at um, experiments with slices of, of brain and, uh, in a dish working out how neurons work at, at the sort of microscopic level. And in parallel, also for more than a, more than a century, uh, has been the study of psychology and behavior. So how we behave, how we perceive things, how we remember things, and uh, how we act in our daily life. And at a certain point, the neuroscience and the study of cognition started to become interrelated, where people began to realize that our brains are what generates our behavior and that it's the neurons that are the key element in our brains that do that. And so essentially the field of cognitive neuroscience slowly came into being where people began to study the basis in, in the behavior of individual neurons and systems of neurons within the brain of our own actual behavior and thoughts and cognition. And so there's an intersection between sort of molecular, biological, uh, neuroscience and cognitive psychology, the study of behavior, uh, which was called cognitive neuroscience. And early experiments um, by people recording from individual neurons in animals or uh, perhaps studying how damage to parts of the brain in, in human neurological patients, how those things related to behavior, for example, what you could and couldn't do after damage to a particular part of the brain or what a particular neurons seem to be representing in the brain, animal models for example. This was the, the start of the area of cognitive neuroscience and then maybe in the, in the late 60s, early 70s this became a, a real topic and slowly began to expand and then by the 90s, 1990s, it became a, a, a big topic in which um, it became clear that you know nearly all psychology departments would uh, need to have some understanding of the relationship to the brain of the cognitive things they studied and nearly all systems neuroscience uh, departments that were interested in, in the biology of neurons would need to know something about what they actually do, how they generate brains and behavior and perception. And so in the, in the mid 90s, the University College London decided to set up an Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience where we are now, uh, which I think in this country was the first institute of cognitive neuroscience to bring together people from psychology and neurology and neuroscience so they could all be in the same building to try to understand what they had in common about uh, their knowledge of how the brain worked and how it helped us to behave and perceive and remember and think. So within uh, cognitive neuroscience now there are many subfields. People are interested in, in how we perceive the world around us, interested in vision and hearing and touch and also of course um, people interested in um, action, how we move, uh, motor neuroscience and in the middle people interested in higher cognitive thought for example, um, memory, planning, decision making and so if you think um, the traditional uh, psychology department would have interest in all of these different areas uh, and now um, obviously as people are interested in how the brain generates these different aspects of cognition. Uh, so we see cognitive neuroscience has interest in all these different areas too. And so um, we see particularly exciting uh, generation of new ideas coming all the way from understanding how neurons in visual cortex represent what we're seeing pioneered by Hubel and Wiesel's work in, in the 60s, going all the way through to motor neuroscience and understanding how activity of neurons in the motor cortex, for example, uh, via the spine actually um, controls muscle contractions and allows us to move. And then in the middle, there's the enormous area of cognition between perception and action, which includes how we remember uh, things that have happened to us before and how that can inform what we're going to do next and how we can think about the future, plan what we're going to do. Uh, and, um, and I haven't even mentioned language, which for humans is a, a very important area 
though a little bit harder to study in animals than some of these other areas. Well, nowadays, I think we see in cognitive neuroscience uh, people who've come into the field perhaps neither from uh, a standard psychology background or from a uh, background in neurology or perhaps biology. We do see people from all of these uh, areas coming into cognitive neuroscience, but also people, for example, uh, who studied uh, physics or engineering, make it easy for them to design experiments or use uh, new technologies which are coming online. So one of the drivers of uh, the expansion in cognitive neuroscience, as well as the realization that the brain was the, the key to understanding many aspects of behavior and cognition, is the advance of technology. And we see that in many different areas. So for example, in basic neuroscience, now we see molecular biology and optogenetic techniques that allow us to uh, affect the activity of patterns of different kinds of neurons within the brain and we can see how that plays out in behavior and we can record from that, that kind of activity. And in human cognitive neuroscience, obviously uh, functional brain imaging has given us a window into looking at metabolic activity and how it varies across the brain while people are thinking about different things or uh, perceiving different things or, or even um, acting as long as they don't move their head too much. Uh, so uh, given this technological advance, there's also a role for computer scientists and engineers and, and physicists and so on to come into this area to, to make the uh, most of the new technology which is enabling new experiments and therefore enabling the whole field to uh, continue to expand and, and make new um, discoveries. So I think um, the big advances in cognitive neuroscience have come through um, people from different disciplines working together. Certainly initially there wasn't really uh, many departments of cognitive neuroscience and there weren't students who trained in cognitive neuroscience and so obviously uh, cognitive scientists and neurologists, people who knew how to do functional neuroimaging and neuroscientists had to come together to interact to explore uh, new explanations that could be made of cognition and behavior given what we know about what's happening uh, in the brain. But uh, that would sort of characterize, I think, the state of the field in the 1990s. And now there are many cognitive neuroscience programs and there are students who have done degrees or master's courses or PhDs in cognitive neuroscience. And so there are many sort of modern researchers who perhaps um, would still consider themselves to be a psychologist or a neuroscientist or a physiologist, but now they're able to use a range of techniques which allow them to study behavior and cognition at the same time as aspects of what's happening in the brain. And so nowadays I think the, the modern cognitive neuroscientist is an interdisciplinary worker, but it's become an, a, a more of a mature field so that you could say that you're just a cognitive neuroscientist and that is your field. So I think there are several, um, there are several interesting developments in cognitive neuroscience at the moment which really um, exemplify the, the current direction of, of the field of understanding the brain and behavior. And one of these I think um, you would say is, is broadly mental health. So for a long time people understood psychiatry and clinical psychology in terms of um, treatments and drugs that happen to work uh, and that there's a long history of experience with, but the actual mechanism of how that treatment um, actually changes the behavior or the aspects of cognition that, that are uh, dysfunctional is not well understood. So what that mechanism is, is, is not really known. And uh, recently there's been a trend towards trying to understand what these mechanisms are, both in, in healthy, uh, normally um, processing people, and how they've gone wrong in certain psychiatric or neurological conditions, so that we can try to understand behavioral interventions and pharmacological interventions in terms of the neural mechanisms that you want to restore or that you want to change back to how they should be. And so this area of uh, mental health becoming, if you like, more of a, more of a science, more like neuroscience than um, a practical experience dependent field like medicine, uh, that's, a, that's a big area in which uh, there is current advance. The other end of the scale in which there's a lot of advance, of course, is the, the revolution in molecular biology. The fact that we can now 
record and control the activity of neurons and synapses within the brain with, with great specificity, often in animal models, means that we can really investigate the, the neural mechanisms of, of cognition in a way that we could not before. And so it's possible to, for example, reactivate the neurons that were um, active in a particular situation and show that the, the mouse in this case thinks that it is back in that situation again. So the molecular biology, has the technological advances, has also made a, a big advance at the sort of microscopic level that informs cognition. And equally at the macroscopic level, what goes wrong with, with global cognition is beginning to be understood in terms of um, the mechanisms that happen to, uh, within the brain uh, involving actual neurons and synapses. So the future for cognitive neuroscience, I think, is to uh, make actual practical uh, impact on treatment in psychiatry and mental health um, and in neurology. And so ideally, beginning to understand what the neural mechanisms are behind uh, normal cognition and how uh, aspects of cognition can go wrong should really begin to impact on, on treatment and therapy. And so the next uh, 10 years really hopefully we'll see a combination as we saw between psychology and cognitive science and neuroscience. In cognitive neuroscience there should now be a merging between um, mental health practices and psych psychiatry and uh, cognitive neuroscience and neuroscience which will hopefully begin to put uh, this kind of mental health medicine onto a firm mechanistic background rather than uh, having to rely essentially on treatments that we know work but we don't really know why they work.